All right, hi, my name is Trey Berg, and tonight I'll be presenting on scaphoid fractures. Uh, for an outline of tonight, uh, I'll talk about the anatomy involved with the wrist and hand bones, uh, etiology that causes scaphoid fractures, some evaluation techniques, treatment options, and returning to activity. Uh, first, we begin with the anatomy here. You can see the, all the metacarpal bones. Uh, the scaphoid there in the anterior view is, sits right there. Posterior view, you guys can all read there and see that. Um, some unique characteristics of the scaphoid is it actually articulates in the distal and proximal row of metacarpal bones. And the long boat shape, as it's described, of the bone and its kinematics when you move into extension put it at high risk for fractures. Um, so etiology, the uh, scaphoid bone is at risk. Uh, the biggest mechanism of injury is that falling on outstretched hand or foosh. Uh, the scaphoid is at most prone to injury when the hand is, or the wrist is extension, in extension, and radial deviated. This has the uh, highest risk. 97% of fractures, scaphoid fractures, occur in this extension landing. Only 3% occur landing in flexion. Um, so clinical presentation, when an athlete or a client or patient comes in, they're going to mainly is that mechanism of injury I just previously described. 97%, as I stated, um, are falling on outstretched hand. Some other signs and symptoms is complaining of a deep, dull pain in the wrist, worsened by gripping or squeezing, and then the key note here is the anatomical snuff box, which I have a picture up here, fullness or swelling in that and pain in that area as well. Uh, evaluation techniques that we can do, uh, first the scaphoid shift or also the Watson test. Uh, I'll let you guys read all the sensitivity and specificities. Um, first the scaphoid, the Watson test, I'll just explain it briefly or how it's done. Um, the examiner will have a hand around the metacarpals and a hand on the scaphoid. And when the examiner will go into older deviation and extension and then into radial deviation and flexion. And as they're doing that, they're putting pressure on the scaphoid, feeling for a clunk or a click or pain. Um, the scaphoid stress test is similar, but the examiner will have a hand on the scaphoid, and then the, a patient will actively go into radial deviation and feel for that same clunk. It uh, indicates fracture instability. Um, a couple that we do in the training room more commonly is just the anatomical snuff box tenderness test, which is simply just that pain tenderness in that snuff box area. The um, thing I found with that was that with a high sensitivity and a low specificity is the, a lot of tests found that this will show, uh, will be a comment for all fractures, but also can have a lot of false positives because there's a lot of things in the anatomical snuff box. It could be a different fracture, basis of the first, or um, the nerve running through there, pushing on that when it's swelling can cause pain, so giving a false positive. Uh, axial compression test is a common one we use for fingers. Uh, there was no specificity or sensitivity I found in literature. Um, it, literature really argued whether it worked or not, and most of them came to the conclusion it didn't work for detect, uh, detecting a scaphoid fracture because there's so much going on there. And then if there's swelling, you can confuse it with the base of the first. Uh, then this leads to our imaging techniques. So the first one is radiography, x-ray. Um, those three views right there are common ones, the AP lateral and oblique. Um, another one I found in literature is actually the scaphoid view. Um, the patient is put into ulnar deviation and extension, and then the x-ray is shot at a special angle, which is shown to be a better view for detecting. Um, when I get into treatment, I will discuss a little more about how the treatment progress, what normally is done, but the kind of the common practice right now that I found in literature for the scaphoid fractures, if they come in with the mechanism of injury and have the signs and symptoms, and um, the swellness, the, the swelling and the pain in the anatomical snuff box, x-ray is indicated there. Um, if the initial x-ray is negative, the right now the current practice is we take two weeks in a short, short thumb spica, and then re-x-ray re two weeks if the symptoms haven't gotten any better. Um, this uh, has been argued a little bit now and is changing. Um, the MRI and CT have becoming, not historically were done for scaphoid fractures, but becoming more commonly used. Uh, they suggest, the current literature suggests that it'll change treatment 90% of the time if you do it after initial acute um, negative reading of an x-ray. So if you get an x-ray that comes back negative, 
If you do an MRI or a CT right now, they're saying that 90% of the times it'll change your treatment strategies. Um, the only problem with that is just there's more money involved in this. Um, so bone scans is another one. It's comparable to MRI and CT on their accuracy. Um, the review suggests that it is a cost-effective and accurate method, and um, it could actually be better than the two-week x-ray repeated. Um, so here I just put a picture of a simple x-ray, and um, as you can see here, right in this area is the fracture, and that's actually a middle um, waist fracture of the scaphoid. Um, so here I'm just going to do give you a little uh, background on the different classifications. A is a tubercle fracture, B, distal pull, C is the waist in the middle, D is the proximal pull. Um, so going back to the anatomy a little bit now, the tubercle fracture, the distal pull, and the waist fracture, if it is non-displaced, which I'll get into in a little bit as well, um, treatment is usually pretty good with immobilization. They usually get a pretty good healing with that. Um, kind of the trouble one is the proximal pull, and that's because of the lack of blood supply to the area. Um, due to the lack of blood supply, you, the healing is prolonged and you get a high rate of non-union. So that D, that last one there, is kind of the, the, bad, the bad one you don't like with scaphoid fracture. So this gets us to the treatment options. Um, this first bullet here is kind of what I was saying. If that initial um, x-rays are negative, it's acceptable to apply that short thumb spike, go wait two weeks, reevaluate, um, do another set of x-rays. Um, now to the two, um, when they're discussing treatment options, the two different fractures they separate into is non-displaced and displaced. Uh, non-displaced fractures, um, the distal and the uh, waist, as I said, usually heal well with strict mobilization. And I uh, put four to six weeks, and uh, the more I look at it, the more articles um, are tended to be a little prolonged with that, and actually more out in the eight to 12 weeks due to uh, just the high risk of non-union in scaphoid. It's not a, like other bones. Um, so screw fixation could be used if we're an athlete or a high risk and we want to try to speed up the process. Um, if it's that proximal area though, a proximal fracture, then it's an orthopedic consultation just because of that um, necrosis chance. Um, that doesn't mean though they have to do it um, operatively or screw fixation, they can do a conservative treatment with that long arm cast um, as well. Uh, if displaced fracture, uh, these are high rates of non-union, especially the proximal pull. Uh, operative treatment is recommended generally for non-displaced. Less than two millimeters, you can go away with conservative treatment, but they suggest eight to 12 below elbow plaster applied for that. Um, if it's greater than two millimeters, operative fixation is recommended. Um, operative, it's uh, usually a screw placed in there. Um, I don't have any pictures of that, but. All right, so I've said non-union a lot in scaphoid, because that's, I mean, that's a big problem with it. Uh, either if you have someone that's non-union, you can go in and do another graft in this, and I'll get into these. Um, or if you, it's a proximal pull fracture, you can actually do this for trying to prevent a non-union. So the first one on the left here is a local vascularized grafting. So they'll take a radial artery coming down on the radial side, and in that little checked box you can see, and they'll redirect it into the scaphoid, giving it a blood supply. Um, another one they can do is the free medial con condyl vascularized bone transfer. And that's actually in the knee, you get a branch with more artery, and then they'll take those and then redirect that into the scaphoid to give it blood supply, give it nutrients. Hopefully not have a non-union in that case. Positives and negatives of these two different ones. Um, the local, you only have one surgical site. Um, they can be under regional anesthetics, whereas the other one, you have two surgical sites, double the risk of infection of general surgery things, and um, they need to be under full body anesthetics. So returning to activity, whether um, this you could go on for a long time depending on what type of fracture, where it's at. Um, once cast removed, all literature says each surgeon's different, follow their protocol. Um, different stretching, strengthening exercises, it can let you guys read those, different examples of those. Um, rehab is going to follow normal progression. Uh, as tolerated, like I said, this is normally about an 8 to 12 week process and can be prolonged if they're worried about non-unions. Um, also with this, I didn't talk about one treatment, but um, surgery with the, uh, with the fixation, usually they'll let start moving the wrist in about two to four weeks. Um, so conclusion, uh, here's some of the things I talked about tonight. Uh, the anatomy, ideology, evaluation techniques, treatment options, returning to activity. Uh, does anyone have any questions? That's my reference if anyone has any.
Thank you.